So it's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr Jackie Huggins AM. Dr Huggins is a Bidjara and Birugabi Juru woman from Queensland who has worked in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs for over 30 years and is the co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. Dr Huggins is a, is a celebrated historian and author who has documented the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people throughout the decades. In 2001, Jackie received a member of the Order of Australia for services to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Throughout her career spanning over four decades, Jackie has played a leading role in reconciliation, literacy, women's issues and social justice. On a personal note, Jack, Jack, Dr Huggins has significantly shaped my journey of reconciliation. I remember having the honour of meeting you, Jackie, when I was a PhD student about 15 years ago and I learnt more in a conversation with you than I ever did in any of the books that I learnt, so thank you very much. Um, so Dr Huggins' keynote address is entitled Reflections on the Reconciliation Journey. It's a great pleasure I invite Dr Huggins to address us today. Thank you very much, um, Andrew, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. I'm glad you learnt something from me all those years ago. <laughs> and I hope to continue that uh, people, whenever, whenever Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander spe people speak, that you listen with intent and uh, you listen deeply to what uh, we are saying, please. What a mully, everybody. Um, from my father's country in North Queensland. Um, and I want to say, uh, it's always been a custom to recognise that uh, you walk on the lands of people um, who are from this area, from this local place. And accordingly, I want to thank my sister, uh, Joy um, Murphy Wandon, who I guess has been in the game for as long as I have. <laughs> Uh, building those bridges, talking about uh, reconciliation in our country and uh, trying to do the very best that we can in terms of, um, I guess, getting that sensibility of, uh, of uh, who we are as Aboriginal people being placed at the centre of uh, uh, people's uh, experience and uh, intensities. Uh, Joy, I want to thank you for um, the work that you've done over, over the years, for your hospitality, your graciousness. Um, I, love, I love the ceremony of the leaves uh, being handed to us. Um, uh, and I, I take that uh, with great pride. I want to pay my respects also to the elders, past, present, and our future elders who are coming through as well. And I must say, uh, Joy, you do the best welcomes, along with my auntie's uh, daughters here from Brisbane. Auntie Valda does them in Brisbane as well. So um, thank you. And it's the, it's, uh, the great um, welcome from our women. And thank you very much to Andrew for the smoking ceremony as we, as we came in. That was a beautiful touch. And I think if you go through the smoke, you feel the... The healing of that smoke um, on your body and in your mind and, and attempting to, um, oh, well, it does. It does relieve you of a lot of pressures in life, but also relieves you of, um, of um, uh, some of the tension that we might have ar around us uh, in our daily lives. But more than that, it settles you, it focuses you, and it gives you uh, permission to enter uh, and permission to have conversations which I might say are just absolutely fabulous. It's quite remarkable to see a room here, um, over 300 people. You know, sometimes I don't think I would have ever dreamed that the reconciliation uh, movement would uh, still be continuing and thriving uh, in this way as when I joined it 30 years ago. So it's been, um, it's great to see you, our rap partners, uh, I think, I retired in, well I didn't retire from reconciliation, you never ever do, you never ever do, it's part of your DNA. Um, but I stepped down as the uh, co-chair of Reconciliation Australia in 2008 and by then, 2006, we started to see the beginnings of these uh, reconciliation action plans and not, not knowing where they would take us, how many there would be and what kind of uh, results and outcomes that we might 
have about them. And certainly that's the focus of my speech here today, is to talk about um, BRAPS and to talk about, I'll give you some personal reflections about my journey as well uh, throughout reconciliation, um, which has been, as I say, um, tried and true. Um, still here, I guess um, uh, it's a, a good reflection of um, what's happening to all of us, I guess, in our country. But I wish to talk about that uh, very shortly. Um, but before I do, always I want to thank the conference organisers, uh, Reconciliation Australia, Richmond Footy Club, Swinburne University of Technology and their respective institutes, Corin Gadmuch, Gadmuchi and the um, Mindani Turnbull Centre um, for having us too. And uh, look, I've got to say I've uh, uh, always treasured um, National Congress, we've, we've treasured our accord with the Richmond Football Club through Brendan and I so signed a, um, a document here uh, at the beginning of the year to forge our relationships and to continue that relationship uh, very strongly, which we have. Oh, thank you. A little bit shorter. Uh, and we shrink as we get older, so I believe. But anyway, that's another story. Not going there. <laughs> um, Look, I was uh, very honoured to, to be joined by um, Aaron Clark and, uh, and uh, four staff from the um, um, Richmond Footy Club to the United Nations in April this year. And uh, that was quite an experience for all of us. I guess I've been to the UN a, a couple of times now and I uh, are quite used to the procedures and the, you know, what you have to do. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a, an effort sometimes, but I must say, having, having uh, your staff there with me, Brendan, really alleviated uh, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the, you know, the huge business that we have to do. We had side events. You, uh, your uh, staff were, were wonderful in their side events, and they talked about uh, this place and uh, you know, the great work that you do as well. And I want to thank, um, thank them over there, um, through Aaron and Scott. And, uh, and the girls too. Um, I hope that we can do that because I think it's really important as we talk about reconciliation that this is a global issue. You know, it's not only something that we talk about in our, um, in our own country, but it is something that uh, needs to be uh, focused globally uh, as well. I've been a very strong advocate of the uh, reconciliation action plans and I'm very proud to have been associated with the reconciliation movement over many, many years. I've met so many, so many good people and I've met some bad people too, <laughs> as you do. I have had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And I guess that will always continue to do so uh, and with you as well as you uh, forge your journeys with uh, the reconciliation movement. Not only is it the right thing to do, but uh, it is the proper thing to do. Welcome to countries are fantastic now. I think they're in the vocabulary of our, our, um, our events right across this country and they should be used as such. The only place I don't see them being used sometimes is when politicians don't get up and do it. And that always kind of dismays me because they're supposed to be you know, representing their people and I know there's a strong call from the people to see a country that is united, a country that uh, does acknowledge the rich history of its first peoples and to continue to, um, to walk that path with us. I guess for me, I've, um, way back then I thought, I sat down and I thought, well, what does reconciliation mean to me? And I said, well, I can't go on about a really long and, you know, esoteric kind of definition. I sat down one day and it, I still stick by this, you know, some, some many years later. For me, it means uh, recognition, justice, and healing. 
those are the three principles by which I have tried to address my life through reconciliation, but also uh, to look at ways in which we can um, uh, apply this and circumvent some of the um, other tensions that might exist outside that. So um, those three principles have been very, very important to me. And I wish to acknowledge some of the great leaders, some of the great leaders I have had the privilege to work with uh, in this movement and through uh, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and Reconciliation Australia. And they have been my mentor, my friend, my leader, the late Dr Evelyn Scott, Uh, who passed away uh, two years ago, and um, Vale, um, Mrs Benita Marbo, who will have her funeral in Townsville tomorrow as well. Rest in peace. Um, Charlie Perkins also served on the first council that I was on, um, as well as um, other people like um, throughout the... Uh, Oh, and Ian Viner, of course, and uh, people in Reconciliation Australia, um, Fred Cheney um, and others. Um, Margie Thorpe was also um, on, the f on the council with me on car. And um, Gus Nossel, who I guess is a legend in this town. Um, my people in the home state of Queensland don't quite know who he is. But I said he's a very important man, Sir Gus Nossel, and he was the deputy to uh, Dr Evelyn Scott uh, when she was the, um, uh, the chairperson. Of course, and who, who else can forget? And uh, the senator, Patrick Dodson, who is still doing great work for our people, and uh, Patrick um, continues to, uh, uh, to talk the talk of reconciliation and to uh, serve us well. And there were many others, many others, um, uh, many of whom are not with us anymore because um, when I joined Reconciliation, um, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, I was one of the youngest um, in, my, in my 30s then. Um, and unfortunately, um, many have left us now. Um, uh, there's also, uh, is from this, uh, I'm thinking from this state, Esme Bamblett, who was on the first Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. Um, I came to it in 1994. Uh, that was the second um, uh, Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. We had a sunset clause of 10 years, and we were told, get this right by the end of 10 years, can you please? We did say to the Prime Minister at the time, uh, this is going to be a generational thing. We're not going to be able to, um, uh, to fix this right now, but it will be generation, at least we've made the start. And we can never say to our children, we stood by and did nothing. And of course, um, there are many of you in this room that have been associated with the movement, too many to name, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and non-Indigenous peoples as well, non-Indigenous Australians, uh, thank you. And I salute each and every one of those people who make reconciliation become a reality every, every single day of our lives. Um, as uh, Andrew said, I am a, a Bidjara, a Biri Gabba Juru woman from Queensland. And um, my journey to this is that uh, I guess I started very young when uh, my mother was a campaigner for the 1967 referendum. I was around 11 years of age, 10 to 11 years of age uh, at that time, and I saw her hard work uh, along with um, others in the movement which was called OPAL, which was the One People of Australia League. Um, they were um, the state equivalent, I guess, to FICATSI, uh, they provided housing, uh, education opportunities for people who were then, it was, a, it was an urban uh, shift and drift from communities, from missions, 
um, in the 60s coming to, uh, to cities and to towns. And my mum um, was an activist. Uh, she never said, uh, she always said, I, I don't like politics and uh, I don't consider myself a political person. Well, she was, <laughs> deeply. <laughs> um, under the leadership of the great and late Senator Neville Bonner, the organisation, which was the One People of Australia League, uh, was formed in the, um, around 1962. And that said, well, help those people are coming from the um, uh, country areas and so forth to come to, um, come to our place and uh, offer them, offer them uh, reconciliation in a sense. So I knew back then, and I saw those people, I saw those great men and women uh, of different shades and colours of uh, you know, being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander working together. So it was very natural for me to know that um, there was a, a kind of an open communication that we could use amongst ourselves uh, as much as we use sport to, um, uh, to our advantage, to tell our stories and to... Uh, move with the politics, but to try to do something decent uh, for our nation in terms of that nation building. So from a very young age, I guess I was um, blessed with the idea that uh, you never take a back step, that you always, uh, you always talk up uh, the injustice for your people and uh, where that might lead that. But even back then, you know, we were so, um, we weren't even 2% of the population by then, uh, perhaps 1.5, even one. And, uh, you know, we needed the strength and the, um, uh, you know, the help of others to really uh, bring us forward. And there were some great people, some very decent uh, people in our lives that uh, uh, had seen the injustice that was, uh, meshed out to our people and really wanted to do something. So um, I guess I was um, smitten from uh, a very young age in terms of the reconciliation movement, although we hadn't termed it as such. We didn't know what that was like and where that could um, absolutely lead us. Um, my mother was always, she was a great communicator uh, and she always you know, used that expression which drives me crazy. Uh, bless, bless her soul, but you know, when we cut our, cut our wrists, we're kind of, we're cut, you know, we, we all got the same red blood. And I just think, oh, well, please don't use that <laughs> expression too much. Um, but she always used it, and I kind of, you know, down the track, you learn from your parents' sayings and so forth. And I thought, yeah, well, she was so wise and so wonderful in terms of how she saw the world. Uh, uh, through my very young radical days, would you believe? Um, <laughs> I didn't see it as quite as well, and um, I'm sure Andrew knows some of my early writings um, around um, feminism and racism and uh, uh, all that, and some of you might have read them too. Um, um, have I mellowed? Yes, I have, but I haven't forgotten the message for you all, you know. Um, so some people say to me, oh, God, I've just met you. You're just so kind of like, you know, your words used to fly off the page and you know, we're so scared of you and all this. I said, I said, good, you know. <laughs> don't drop my guard on that one, all right? So, yes, we do change in life, don't we? You know, and as a woman in her 60s and proudly doing that, I'm, I'm hoping that I find the wisdom that uh, my dear mum, who was a single mum, um, had taught me because my dad died when I was two years of age. He, was a pr he came back from the war, he was a prisoner of war in the Thai Burma Railway. And uh, next year, I go over there to um, look at the place that he was sent to the, to the um, to Hell's Gate as well, and to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's my next big venture is I'm going to write um, the book about him and my grandfather, World War I, as well, because all of us have uh, military history um, as uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that's my next big project. Um, when I can find some space to, uh, uh, to uh, lessen the politics, but you, you don't do that as the National Co Chair of uh, the National Congress of Australia's First People, where our remit is everything. But, um, yeah, so that's, that was a little bit about how I came to be and how, it, um, how my reconciliation uh, journey has been uh, 
has been focused. Um, I must say that um, in 1994, when I got the call from Robert Tickner, who was then the minister uh, for uh, in the Keating, Keating years, who had asked me would I consider putting my hand up to be on the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, um, I said, give me a week to think about it, because by then we'd started to hear, what does that mob do? Glossy brochures, you know, all this, and I'm still at the height of my radical days, and I don't know whether I want to do this, you know. Um, so I said, give me a week. I came back to him after a week. I discussed it with many people. Um, and then um, uh, for me, I said yes, and it, it was probably one of the best decisions of my life to have uh, joined the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation as I learnt so, so much um, around um, the, our nation, uh, nationhood building and where, um, where this might lead. Um, I still continue today. Um, it never leaves you. I'm the patron for uh, Reconciliation Queensland, along with the, um, uh, the ex-Governor-General, uh, Dame Quentin Bryce. So she and I um, are their patrons. Um, I also have a local group at my um, suburb home in the Gap in Queensland. And look, that's one gap I don't want them to close. <laughs> Queensland. Postcode 4061, please stay away from that. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, need that open. Um, but I won't say that too publicly because I wanted them to close the gap in all the other areas, okay? That's part of our journey too in reconciliation. Um, and the, our local group um, called uh, Ballangari, they have a, uh, a, a group that are now framing a treaty between the local inhabitants, of which I've lived over there probably 40 years or so, uh, between its local mob and uh, the people that have come there since. So that's uh, fantastic. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get to um, any of the meetings, many of the meetings, because um, I travel, I think I was saying to someone uh, today, I think I've done 10,000 Ks this week, not steps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, uh, from Uluru, I was up at Uluru at the weekend, um, back to Brisbane, back to Melbourne, to Canberra, here in Melbourne, and guess what? I'm having a pampered weekend in Dalesford this weekend. <laughs> now, thank you. <laughs> I do that every, every year. I have to do that every year in December with a bunch of friends. We just take ourselves there. I think Dalesford is one of the most beautiful places, and you as Victorians know that. And, uh, you know, there are spas and there are the springs and, uh, uh, you know, Devonshire teas and stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, I always, that's my little treat for myself. And I think for all of us who do this work, this liberation work, you know, we need those sessions, we need those uh, outs and that, that kind of downtime. So I'm really looking forward to. Uh, to going to Dalesford uh, this weekend and then home Sunday. So, um, yeah, so that's, um, that's me. That's where I've, I've started and where I've kind of uh, ended up. It were very difficult years through the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. We, uh, we had the Howard years in the Howard government. Very hard to get any traction on that. I remember sitting with um, two great ladies from the Stolen Generation who said to him, came to a meeting of ours and they said, please, Prime Minister, would you consider, reconsider your apology to the stolen generations? Um, he was just stony-faced. He did not talk at the end of that. And, um, you know, it was uh, quite an emotional uh, out. But we thought, uh, well, we're probably not going to get anywhere um, with the present government. And of course, then along in came uh, Kevin Rudd in the year 2008, offered that apology, which was um, a, great, um, a great blessing for our people. But as we know, we have to continue the journey and continue um, closing the gap around that. And along came with that, the gap, closing the gap targets and measures and so forth, much like the, the RAP plans that you, that you have now. There were highs and lows, as I say. We oversaw WIC, Marbo um, decision, native title, stolen generations, 
uh, are heaps of other social issues uh, as well. And um, when we put our six recommendations to, um, to, the, to the parliament, um, one of those recommendations was for a treaty um, for our people. Um, now that, uh, and an apology, of course, which we, which we have seen. But treaty back in those days was uh, not, a, not a word that governments would buy, or really it was kind of a little bit staggered to within communities because no one knew what a treaty was. The treaty, um, uh, if we could say a compact, an agreement, or something else, but disguise it, not to call it a treaty, um, uh, we could you know, have that in. Of course, we, we, de we defied all that and we put treaty in. So treaty still remains as one of our original recommendations for the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, as well as constitutional reform. You know, this is uh, way back in 2000 when we handed the report in. We're still working on those things. And, uh, you know, we're still seeing some, um, uh, you know, some efforts, I hope. But uh, it's been long and testing and it works at glacial pace uh, sometimes. Of course, back then too, we didn't see the environmental damage that, um, that is being caused today. Um, I've just recently been on some consultations with the late, um, um, uh, with, uh, it's not the late, she'll kill me for that. Um, <laughs> lately, I meant to say June Oscar. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the PFAS stuff in Catherine is the stuff that they're talking about, which is um, really um, getting into the water systems and you know creating a terrible, terrible damage um, environmentally, but on a health basis too for our people who use those river systems as well. Those sorts of things back then um, uh, were a blip on the horizon, but uh, they weren't being as pronounced as they are now in terms of. Uh, having uh, reconciliation um, components to them as well. So, um, so, so much for my introductory remarks when I, when I kind of thought, oh, an hour, how am I going to get through this? Well, that was pretty easy because I can talk about reconciliation for quite some time, but I do believe there will be time for questions. So I'm, I will get on to the formal part, if you don't mind, of, which I hope you've, you found the first part as, as interesting as the, the more formal one here. But uh, as I say, um, you know, I could talk about this for ages because it is such a, a noble cause and something that, um, as I say, if you, if you um, come into this space, don't be prepared to walk away tomorrow because it is a lifelong adventure, lifelong journey for you all too, as it has been for me. So we all share the uh, vision of a united country where there is a depth of knowledge and respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and cultures. An aspect of this vision is a country in which the gap is closed, except 40, where was it? <laughs> six, uh, <laughs> six one, yeah, 4061 in Brisbane, where the gap is closed between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other Australians in terms of health status, educational attainment, employment, housing, incarceration, and child removal rates. Our vision is also for a country that understands Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, recognises them as the foundation on which modern Australia was built, and takes pride in being the host of the oldest continuous civilization known to humankind. The reconciliation movement supports constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and it understands the need for an urgent and sustained national effort to rediscover and educate all Australians about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, histories and knowledge systems. Although it has not been articulated as essential to the reconciliation movement, I can say that in my considerable experience, I have yet to meet a person who supports reconciliation that does not support the statement from the heart delivered at Uluru at the conclusion of the consultation process with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and conducted by the Referendum Council in 2017. 
I will not dwell on the details of the consultation process as I expected that all here today know that we have asked for three outcomes of the constitutional uh, recognition process. That is a voice to parliament, a truth and justice commission and agreements or treaties at the Commonwealth state and territory and local government levels. I think most would agree with me that we face extremely strong headwinds in achieving these outcomes, but hope springs eternal. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are nothing if not patient and persevering and with the help of other Australians committed to reconciliation. We continue our inst insistence on these outcomes as just as desirable and as important milestones in our quest for a united and reconciled country in which we may go forward together. Now I'll turn to a brief history of uh, the movement and its successes. The, uh, the movement which began following the Royal Commission into the Aboriginal deaths in custody in 1991. The Commonwealth established a council for Aboriginal reconciliation and set a 10 year program to achieve a sea change in knowledge, attitudes, actions and public policy toward Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. The movement has had some strong successes, both symbolically and in public support. Who could not forget that march on the 28th of May 2000, when an estimated 2,000, uh, sorry, 2,250,000 2, people turned out for the walk um, uh, for reconciliation across the Sydney Harbour Bridge, making it the largest political demonstration ever held in Australia. While this has not been repeated in Sydney, marches have been and continue to be held in a number of cities across the country. And I know that here in Melbourne too, I attended that one not long after the, um, the march in Sydney. Lots of people, as, as there was uh, in Brisbane too. I'd estimated maybe we'll get five, million, uh, five million, we wish, 5,000 people um, over the... Uh, uh, Bridge at Brisbane, we got 75,000 people, which was uh, quite spectacular. And they replicated the sorry, the sorry sign as well. A number of states establish reconciliation councils, which conduct activities and promote reconciliation throughout the year, but especially in Reconciliation Week. The origins of Reconciliation Week are not well known but they are interesting in that they show the breadth of community interest and involvement in reconciliation and the role of the churches, particularly those with an interest in social justice in the reconciliation movement. Reconciliation Week began in 1993 when faith communities of Australia started the prayer for reconciliation. This event morphed into the National Reconciliation Week in 1996 to provide a national focus for all reconciliation activities and a time for all Australians to commit to changes and actions uh, within their circle of influence to promote reconciliation. National Reconciliation Week, as we all know, falls between the 27th of May and the 3rd of June, two very significant dates in relations uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, that is, the anniversary of the 1967 referendum and the anniversary of the 1992 High Court judgment in the Mabo land, land rights case. Another achievement in which the reconciliation movement has had a hand is the widespread uh, knowledge throughout Australia in recent years of the stolen generations. It is arguably the case that reconciliation movement is responsible for the bipartisan notion that there should be some form of constitutional change to recognise First Australians. The details of this should occur and are debated, of course, um, at length and stretch all the way from a purely symbolic preamble to demands of recognition of sovereignty. I have already mentioned the statement from the heart which occupies that middle ground. The matter has and continues to flounder in the political too hard basket, about which I will have uh, more to say in a few minutes. But my point is that at this juncture, 
This is where the reconciliation movement may rightfully claim a good degree of responsibility for putting the issue on the national agenda. Reconciliation Australia provides organisational leadership of the reconciliation movement, which reaches down to towns and communities across the country. If somewhat sporadically and unevenly, but nevertheless, you are there. One of the main activities of Reconciliation Australia has been the institution and promotion of RAPS, which were introduced in 2006, and other speakers here today and throughout the conference uh, will cover the details of the development of RAPS. Um, I suppose to say that RAPS are envisaged as a vehicle for organisations and companies to play a, an important part in improving respect and relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other Australians. RAPS are developed in consultation with Aboriginal stakeholders. Design features include an emphasis on action, measurability and accountability. Many RAPs include cultural awareness training, employment targets for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, acknowledgement of traditional owners at meetings and events and in publications, and the sponsorship of these events. Organisations with RAPs have contributed to scholarships for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, donations and pro bono support to Aboriginal organisations, employment opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the procurement of goods and services from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses. Now, tomorrow, I go to the BUPA uh, Reconciliation Action Plan. Uh, we, along with that, they have provided a scholarship um, for their staff, uh, which, is, which is going to be called the Dr Evelyn Scott Scholarship Program, which is absolutely fantastic. And um, it's a great way to honour um, Evelyn, who uh, spent her twilight years uh, in a Bupa home in Cairns, so that's where she sadly passed away. Um, but uh, what a way to honour the true heroes of our reconciliation movement and the people who've been involved for so long. Um, so I'm very proud to, to be there tomorrow. But hopefully I'll be back to, to hear Aaron speak in the afternoon. Um, in my view, RAPs play an important role in promoting recon reconciliation by increasing the visibility of our people and ultimately by changing public opinion towards our people and our issues. I think that schools and educational institute institutions, companies and organisations that have instituted RAPs share the responsibility and achievement of a gradual groundswell of ordinary Australians who are interested in and support uh, reconciliation. Just recently, I had the pleasure to meet that young girl, Harper, who um, uh, did not stand for the national anthem uh, in Brisbane. Um, and I said to her school, you need to do a rap. You really do need to do a rap. So hopefully uh, uh, the we saw the education minister. Uh, she's taken that on board too. So hopefully uh, that school will be doing a rap in Kenmore. And uh, RAPs uh, are the way that employers, institutions, organisations and companies are showing social responsibility and leadership in an area of public policy that has challenged politicians and that is often bogged down in intractable and, uh, and complex issues. In the decades since RAPs were initiated, over 1,000 organisations have developed a RAP and many others are in the process of developing them. The corporate and not-for-profit sectors have been strong supporters of the RAP program, as have national supporting um, sporting bodies, uh, clubs, etc., and educational institutions such as Swinburne. And it's great, Linda, that uh, Swinburne, it's a bit like my old Al Almata, University of Queensland, who hadn't had a RAP for ages. I think they're actually on the same path as you, but at least you're there, at least you're doing it for us. And it sounds fantastic, the work that Angela and Andrew and uh, Andrew are doing, so congratulations there. And more than uh, 20,000 people in RAP organisations have completed uh, cultural training, uh, uh, training, immersion, call it what you will, cross-cultural um, uh, training, 
And uh, that can only be a good thing when people learn about us. Other, other speakers, of course, will be speaking about that. Now, I want to digress momentarily uh, to put in a plug for an aspect of cultural awareness training that I would like to see as part of every RAP. Now, listen very carefully, please, Karen and others. <laughs> the and you're probably doing this now, I don't know. But the familiarity of the provisions of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was endorsed by Australia in 2009. Now, that declaration includes articles relating to many aspects of Indigenous affairs, and I'd like to see the employees of organisations with RAPs examine the provisions related to their industries in consultation with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Indeed, it is my wish that every Australian student and employee would be familiar with the declaration and press the Australian government to implement it domestically. Now, I've talked about, thank you, I think it's very important that we do that. <coughs> now, what I've spoken about, um, I think the comments have been fairly positive. And as I said uh, uh, earlier, I'm a great supporter of both uh, the movement and the raps. However, I think it is time and very important that we also consider other perspectives, perhaps some of the challenges that might beset your organisations as well. And please listen carefully to this. To do so, we need no further than the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, a stone's throw from both Old Parliament House and where Reconciliation Australia has had and has its uh, headquarters. The Reconciliation Place on the, lakes of, uh, on the banks of Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra, both there and in many communities around the country, we can find deep um, cynicism about the concept of reconciliation and indeed raps. We find that as well all across our communities. At their most extreme, naysayers argue that reconciliation is a vehicle for government propaganda to smooth over oppression and historic and contemporary injustice perpetrated on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people retain claims to sovereignty and amongst this group, some do not recognise the legitimacy of parliament and other non-Indigenous authorities. For these critics, there can be no reconciliation without justice. They argue that reconciliation cannot occur until issues of land and cultural dispossession and trauma are resolved. After adequate redress has been argued, and, and um, sorry, after adequate redress has been agreed, they argue that reconciliation will occur automatically. A variant of these views is that the main purpose of the reconciliation movement is to assure white people's guilt, in part because such views are quite per pervasive amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I think it would be a mistake to automatically dismiss these views as cynical and negative. I believe that to facilitate success of the reconciliation movement, we would do well to carefully consider these views, to assess their merit, and if they have uh, reasonable grounds to be addressed. Before I relate, um, <coughs> excuse me, before I relate examples to assist us in that process, I want to refer to the recent controversy about the recognition of veterans on domestic flights. I think there are parallels from which we can learn. A range of views were expressed on that subject, but it appears that the overriding one was that veterans preferred substance to symbolism. Unless they saw tangible benefits such as a price discount, many preferred not to be differentiated from other passengers. I think the outcome of the consultations on constitutional recognition tell a similar story. Our people are not very interested in a preamble or even other changes to the Constitution, as evidenced by the statement of the heart. They want substantive changes to improve their lives. 
It is my view that the symbolic aspects of raps are significant, but they are not enough. Raps must be solidly accompanied by substance. <coughs> Let me give you an example. This relates to a major accounting firm which proudly presents its rap. The firm's corporate offices contain prominent Aboriginal artworks. An Aboriginal flag is displayed in the lobby. The firm has a beautifully presented rap booklet. One of the firm's long-standing audit clients is a major Aboriginal organisation which suffered major budget cuts due to reduced Commonwealth allocations. Finances were very tight, so the client asked the firm if it could do the annual audit on a pro bono basis, in whole or in part. The request was ignored at first, then finally denied. The CEO of the Aboriginal organisation was somewhat disappointed by this response and cemented, uh, commented wryly that he had asked, he had thought he could have a box of the firm's wraps de de delivered to him by return courier. I do not know the, the details of this case or the firm's reasoning for its response. Possibly it was already doing a lot of other pro bono work for Aboriginal clients. But the way the issue was handled, obviously, suggested to the CEO of the Aboriginal organisation in question that the firm was possibly more interested in PR and symbolism than in substance regarding reconciliation. I have seen similar doubts arise in the sponsorship of sporting teams, uh, with questions being asked about uh, whether RAP organisations are assisting Aboriginal groups or, in fact, Abor Aboriginal groups being used by commercial organisations for PR purposes as a way of enhancing um, those reputations. This is sincerely not about the Richmond Footy Club because they do the absolute right thing, Brendan and the mob, but uh, we've heard these stories. I, and I suppose the reciprocity makes for good relations, but given the facts of Australian history and contemporary social and economic circumstances, I can understand that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have some feeling of recompense in regard to generosity on the part of other Australians. They are much less interested in symbolism than in substance. Given our histories, they expect that the genuine commitment to reconciliation should entail giving uh, ground on culture and on the bottom line. This must occur if we are ever to be able to close that gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Indigenous Australians. In my final example, uh, that occurred recently. As I entered an uptown city hotel, I noticed a small plaque above the door which included a replica of the Aboriginal flag and made a statement recognising the traditional owners of the, of the land on which the hotel was built. I was pleased to see it, but I could not help question how much substance was associated with that gesture. Given our socio-economic status, very few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are likely to be guests of an establishment. Further, very few of us would feel comfortable in that environment or even safe. I wondered how different the reception might be from other guests and indeed of the staff toward an identifiable traditional owner compared with the hotel chain CEO or the chair of its board. Would there be any difference in the reception and care that was shown to the two? And would they pay the same tariff? In conclusion, there are many legitimate positions and views regarding the examples that I have used. I reiterate my support for reconciliation and raps, but that support has to come with a clear caveat, which is that reconciliation must involve more than symbolism. To make progress in this area, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as a whole must see advantages flowing from the two types. The first is economical and the second is cultural. In my experience, many RAPs include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment targets, but in a many great instances, these remain aspirational rather than achievements. Where they are achieved, they are overwhelmingly at the lowest levels in the most junior positions. We need recruitment, training and affirmative action programs 
so that organisations genuinely achieve the RAP ambitions they are set for themselves. We know that many organisations are comfortable, even delighted, if they can hire Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who accept for their ancestry can fit into the dominant pretty culture and pretty much uh, uh, indistingu indistinguishu indistinguishably. Such employees can take an escalator up to the incline of occupational advancement. But I want to call this out for what it is, and in many cases it is around not having support and it is around clear not having uh, direction and, let's face it, it's around assimilation. We cannot bear this to happen. While many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have similar material aspirations as anyone else in terms of consumer goods and services, most of us are also proud of our cultural heritage and want to see it maintained and developed. We want our language and knowledge systems taught in schools and universities. We also want some of our cultural practices introduced to workplaces so that it is not always becoming like you, but meeting you and meeting us halfway and adopting some of our own ways as well as knowing and being in this world. For many, this is uncharted territory. But as I see it, these are the challenges that await us if true reconciliation is to occur. Despite some criticism <coughs> and some challenges, there is a lot of goodwill out there, I know it, you know it, we've seen it, around the area of reconciliation. Solid foundations have been made and achievements have been um, made also. And I sincerely look forward to working with you all um, in terms of your organisations and particularly through Reconciliation Australia, um, of which I once co-chaired for seven years, uh, along with Fred Cheney. I really do look forward to, uh, to working with you to extend the movement in uh, the coming months and the coming years, if not the coming generations. What a molly. Thank you very much. Okay, made it. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that thought-provoking speech and talking about um, institutional practices of whiteness and a whole range of issues that I think are going to really challenge the delegates here. So we've got some time for some questions and some roving microphones. So can people um, uh, put their hand up if they've got any questions and we can get a microphone to you. Hi, Dr Huggins. My name's Erin Woolford. I'm with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I'm keen uh, for you to elaborate on what type of practices you'd like to see embedded into organisations um, so our mob don't have to be like you. Um, there's policies now around cultural uh, leave um, that you know we've seen companies embracing, so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you know, can acknowledge things like sorry business. Mm -hmm. um, yes. What what other types of things do you think that we can do to demonstrate leadership and make sure that we're truly reflecting the, ben the, the best parts of both of our cultures? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I guess next couple of days you'll be hearing about some of those best practice. Um, uh, positions that occur in, um, in organisations. I think uh, definitely cultural business, the sorry business, uh, attendance to funerals, um, very, very uh, important. And to other really important events that, um, you know, such as days like this for your staff, you know, to get, uh, to get them along and hear from uh, the networks and, and the experts in, um, uh, in the process of reconciliation because uh, that's, uh, that's very important that, you know, we provide these networks. I mean, many, many years ago we had um, the Australians for Reconciliation was a team of people that went out and we did those yarning circles, you know, way back then. And people were just, first time they'd met it, even met an Aboriginal person. Uh, I hope the, there's a statistic that says to us 65% of this population has never met, spoken to or had a, a relationship. Uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we need to, um, to look at that. Um, sure, within, um, within, uh, uh, within organisations, I think it's important too for um, our own Aboriginal organisations too, which um, 
sometimes we feel that you know we know what's best and uh, you know sometimes that's uh, is usually the case <laughs> um, you know community control groups and, and I think it's um, important that we see and value our, our employees as, uh, as as those people who are going to you know bring us through to the next generation um, I um, particularly um, I particularly um, mentor and I see mentorship I think is is really important too not only and I said I said at the conference last week you can get this mentorship not only from your own mob but you get it from um, uh, non-Aboriginal people as well who can uh, drive you through the process so that's uh, th that's really important but not at the expense of losing our cultural identity or who we are or assimilation and not saying that that um, that, that uh, is going to be the case, but p please, you know, don't um, treat us or don't don't think that we're black fellas in a white skin. Other way around, eh? White fellas in a black skin, because we're not. You know, we come to your place with a very rich heritage for our history, our culture, our families. Our socialisation has been embedded since day one, and we are all political since the day we were born as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country because that is the history and that is the nature of our country. So, you know, please um, look at us with respect and uh, with integrity and know that we've got stories too and we have so much, we have so much to be able to let you know in terms of the environment, of where we've come from in terms of relationships and, uh, you know, we hear the terrible statistics and we get numb to the statistics about you know, how many kids are in, cust in um, custody but also out of care. care. Um, but, you know, there are some really fantastic families who are doing just well, who are doing, you know, um, driving things through. I used to work at a university where I saw our first astrophysics Indigenous student. Um, you know, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, and he wanted to be the first black astronaut. You know, we've seen doctors, we've seen lawyers, we've seen... A whole, um, a whole range of uh, mob come through now and uh, that can only, to the great work. And I do believe it's been around reconciliation too that this stuff has occurred, I really do. It ca can't happen in a vacuum. It can only happen when people of good will, good intention and good heart are able to not only listen deeply but are to action and to implement you know, those changes that we want to see and that we want to see in our lives in terms of our change. Uh, in terms of our country and you know I always say that none of you in this room will ever say when your children and grandchildren come to you and say well what did you do what did you do for uh, black fellas in this country you know at least you were part of it or at least you said I tried and that can only be the best thing I probably haven't answered your questions but I know that that's going to be explored right throughout the con uh, throughout the conference here yeah thank you for that Hi, Jason Smith from the Smith family. Hmm. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion, get your opinion on, or your reflection experience on rap governance and the importance it plays in changing an organisation's system, culture and behaviour. Rap governance, yeah. Oh, look, um, I think it's really important, but I also think that... Uh, uh, you know, the way Reconciliation Australia um, works with the, uh, your RAP partners, uh, the RAP bodies out there is, uh, is a good thing because I think, uh, you know, if that's, um, uh, that can only be, if that's streamlined, then obviously everyone can be on the same page, we would hope. I think where the downfall is quite often is in the implementation. As I said, you can have a bunch of fine words going to say all those things, but, you know, you go back to that organisation in five years' time and what have they done? Really, not much. And I've also heard, uh, talk about governance, uh, that maybe RAP should be audited. Now, that's quite serious. You know, maybe, um, I know at um, one of the organisations um, I used to work for, every, uh, every three years, or two years, actually, we'd come back and look at those measurements and targets and say, have they, been, have they been accountable? Quite often they weren't. So we'd go through the whole process again and you know, something would happen. But I think 
there's something in that in terms of um, um, uh, looking and, and coming back to what you said you'd do. And the governance is uh, really important. I think if you've got a strong steering committee, uh, or whatever you call it, within your own organisations too, are able to drive that. But also you need senior management. You need senior management, board even, right up to the board, uh, okay on this. And this is so serious, I think, in terms of closing the gap in our country, that we need all those measurements uh, you know, really put in place so that we can actually close that gap, which uh, at this, at this uh, point in time, I've heard, there's been some research done on it. It will take 495 years, 495 years to close that gap if we don't all work together and if we're not um, looking at those issues together and working on it together, but with respect, you know, with respect and treating one another as equals. And a partnership, I think, a true partnerships. If anything's taught me about reconciliation, it's around relationships. That's the biggest thing you need to have and follow that through. Yeah. Thanks, James, for your question. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um, we will have to leave questions, I know, um, I apologise, but I just have a, a small gift to thank say you. thank you. Thank that you. Was, um, <laughs>